short of it is How about at the end of the day, you do anything you're not really fascinated by rituals? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to be ethical and to pain and well above. Welcome to the RAS Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Well, good evening, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Uh, nearly Happy New Year, but I'll say it anyway, Happy New Year. Um, maybe calling it a bit early, 10 days before the due date. Um, I could see a few people were guessing that maybe 6 610 is probably a record for us uh, to be late, fashionably late. I must admit, though, tonight it's not me being flash fashionably late. It's me being technically illiterate. I uh, was having an issue on the back end to try and make this happen. So I do apologize about my uh, late arrival. Pink Santa tonight. You can see that here. It's right here. Um, we attended, many of us attended the Ladies Finance Club events run by Molly Benjamin uh, in Melbourne and Sydney over the past two weeks. And Fortunately, I got two of these pink ones, um, and they're actually pretty comfy, to be honest. The only problem is I was trying to find this a few moments ago, and um, I realized my dog ate my other one. So uh, the puppy that we, we bought recently has so far chewed on three remotes, the decking. Uh, she pulled two PowerPoints out of the wall the other day, literally chewed the PowerPoints and pulled them out of the wall. Uh, she's eaten countless many other things. She destroyed our brand new couch. So that is the cost of a puppy. If anyone says that it costs, you know, a few hundred bucks or a couple grand for a new puppy, don't believe them. It's much like uh, it's much like you know being sucked into some active fund managers and uh, thinking that the cost is just a an extra percent, which we'll get to tonight. It's not often the case. Uh, so uh, I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas. Let's get that out of the way. Um, it's going to be a hot one by the seams of it. So wherever you are, I hope you uh, you are well. Uh, your bushfire ready and all that sort of stuff, as we say in Australia. Fraser says, sorry to see the show will end. It has been my starting point for education and entertainment for the last two years and will be missed. Looking forward to the future with Rascor. Um, <laughs> much like crypto, says so Chef Circle. Yeah, so uh, let's, let's hit the nail on the head. Um, I do actually have some slides, so why don't we just jump straight into them. As always, we've you can subscribe, uh, whether you're watching this on ASA, that's uh, the Australian Shareholders Association for those of you playing along at home. Uh, whether you're an ASA, whether you're on RASC or Self Wealth, I know Rob's uh, on a run while also trying to respond to comments in the Self Wealth community. Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, wherever you get this, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah, Jay Campos, yeah, the puppy has been to the vet, and I must admit uh, it has been ridiculously expensive on that front as well. Easily, easily uh, doubled the cost of the dog uh, in the first three months of having it, maybe even more. So um, that's good fun. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, we go live. Uh, this is the thing that people didn't realize when I made an announcement today that the Rask, on the Rask network, and I'll get to this in a second, we actually have four podcasts and I'll get, I'm going to show you some behind the scenes stuff in a moment. Um, we actually have four podcasts and what we do uh, for the Rask live show is actually only a fraction of the broader picture of what we do. So I'll explain that in just a moment. But first, here's the joke. I actually searched quite long and hard for this joke, and I, I thought this was probably the best one that I saw. Astronomers got tired watching the moon go round the Earth for 24 hours. They decided to call it a day. That is my joke. Uh, for any of you, you will know that there is a huge telescope in the back corner here, so I'm quite the fan of looking up at the stars at night. Um, but there it is right there. Uh, so this is one close to home for me indeed. Uh, so uh, am I am I a bit out of focus perhaps uh, for you, Chef, uh, for Paul? Let me just have a quick check of the video signal. It uh, looks like, like I've got uh, 1080p on my end, mate. So I just want to check something. I want to check if that's the right way around. And it is. Good. Okay. Uh, Deepak, you said 10 out of 10 considering the last time we, that we hear it. Well, thank you, Deepak. Okay, so I was crunching some numbers uh, just a little earlier on how long it's been and how many um, people may have tuned into the Self Wealth Live, the precursor to Rask Live. We've been doing this uh, since August 
2021. So Rob, who's in the chat tonight, Rob and I have been showing up every week uh, since 2021, as have many of you. So I know Jeremy, I saw him in the chat tonight. Plant One, who may not be here uh, tonight on time. Uh, we've got Jenny. So many of you, Paul, have been Martin here for such a long time uh, and coming along and uh, being part of the community, which has been amazing. And even meeting so many of you in person at the recent RASC events. Uh, you can see here, I was considerably younger, potentially better looking, but with a terrible haircut. Uh, that was one of the first shows we ever did from Self Wealth Live. Um, and then you can see pr progressively gone downhill or aged uh, over that time. Um, so pocket full of shell, good to have you here. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you to everyone um, who has been here over the last few years and supported us as we've gone on this journey. It's been huge. Like the last couple of years have been pretty volatile in markets, even though say like the NASDAQ 100 and S&P 500 are up considerably. Um, <laughs> Mike. At least you had hair, yeah. Um, well, thanks. It's a, it's that's a quite an achievement when you're in finance and you still have hair left, Mark. I've got to say that it's a, it's rare. It's rare. Pretty stressful industry at times. Um, not as stressful as some, of course, but uh, yeah, I'll take it. So um, I told you to bring your elf hat. So if you've got yours tonight, send us an image over on uh, Twitter or wherever you get your um, social media. You can connect with us. Uh, so as uh, I alluded to. Uh, I, I made the decision uh, over the last few weeks, we've been kind of thinking about this as a business and as our community grows at RASC. Uh, we reflected recently and I shared some information uh, with the community around the decision just to basically transition the RASC live. So we've been doing it for a long time and I know many of you love it and I know it's not an easy decision um, because I know so many of us do enjoy it. Um, but the, the decision to, I guess, slow down the, the RASC live and transition it, and let, I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, comes for two reasons. The first is a bit of balance and also a bit of focus. I was taught really early in my business journey that the most important thing uh, in business or one of the most important things, if not the most important, is actually focus. Uh, focusing on what works and doing that again and again and again and again. And so... Um, you can you can see in this chart here, and this just gives you context over the Rask business. So when you think about our podcast and our audio, uh, the YouTube channel that Rask has and the the stuff that we do in our audio is tiny in comparison to our main podcast channels. And so while I absolutely love doing it, um, we've got to focus on the biggest parts of our business and what our community really love. And so. Um, over the last few months, I've been thinking about this. That's the focus part. And you can see the growth of this is our YouTube channels and our video downloads and that sort of stuff. We actually accumulated more viewership in 2023 than we have in the past five years put together. And then uh, on this chart, this chart shows you the downloads of our podcasts. So Anyone out there uh, that might be familiar with this chart, I've shared this a couple of times, but this shows you the, the growth of our podcast through time. And as you can see, it's grown extremely quickly um, over the years. And I anticipate that it will continue growing because people seem to love it. And I think podcasts as a medium are the best uh, medium for financial information in the world. I think there's nothing that's beaten it, not even uh, our friends at ChatGPT. So... Um, one of the things that, that also comes into balance, uh, comes into focus here is in 2024, some of you already know this, but, um, at RASC, we're actually moving into managing money. So what that takes a bit of a different skill, not a different skill set, but a different kind of focus that I need to apply. And so basically with me and my analyst team, we're going to transition away. We're going to still do our memberships, but we're going to start helping people by managing their money for us. Because let's say, for example, at this one second, I can see that over 150 people are watching this live at this very second. I reckon for every one of us that are tuning into a finance show every week, there would be 500 other people or at least 100 other people who are not that interested in finance. Or if they are, they're not um, they're not really going to you know show up every week and, and tune in like all the rest of us. And so we want to help more people. And uh, the way we can do that is we can help them by 
hopefully managing their money, investing in ETFs and those types of things for them. So that's a transition we're making as a business in 2024. And I want to reward the clients and the members who join us early on for that journey. Uh, and then the way I do that is I prioritize them. So we're still going to do our 10 podcasts a week. <laughs> that's what we do at the moment. Um, so you'll still get on the Rust network, you'll still get the CEO interviews, the authors, the founders, the financial counselors, the financial planners, the Q&A. That's still happening each and every week. It's just for the meantime, I can't also afford to do the, the Rask live show each and every week. So you can still subscribe. You can do all of that. And not only that, anyone, and this is not a pitch, by the way, but anyone that does decide to invest with us or becomes a member of our subscription in 2024, um, we'll get a live show as well, live Q&A. Um, so that won't be probably every week. It'll be every month, but that's just giving you a sense of it. So I hope that kind of explains the business case, the kind of balance across the business and where my focus is going to go. Um, many of you know that I'm supported by some great people at RASC uh, across our network. So it's not just me. There's been some wonderful people. And Rob behind the keyboard has done an absolute wonderful job at Self Wealth to bring the Self Wealth community alive and to get us all rocking up every week. So, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, you've asked a question. Am I right in thinking the acoustic guitar tune at the start of the Australian business podcast is actually yours? Jeremy, great, great question. So um, where is it? Our podcast. So with that, Jeremy, it's actually, so my dad is actually a guitarist and he's the one who creates the tunes for all of the podcasts. And so all of our podcasts have um, an acoustic uh, element to them and all of them are actually created by my old man. And I said to him, I gave him one instruction when he created the acoustics for all of our podcasts. I said, all right, mate. All you've got to do for us is you've got to make it sound Australian because they're all Australian themed. And he's like, what does that mean? And I said, I don't know, just acoustic perhaps. Uh, and so he went and created all of those uh, acoustic tunes that go along with our podcast. Um, so that's it. Uh, no royalties for him though, I've got to say. So no royalties. Thank you very much, Stephen. No royalties. Um, but he gets a lot of pride in knowing that uh, the podcast last year were downloaded six or this year were downloaded six million times. So he's getting some good airtime, um, even though uh, he doesn't get the royalty checks. Um, so that's where they come from, Jeremy. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. So I wish I could play a guitar half as good as he, he could or even the piano half as well as he does. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, Goon, this is an interesting thing. You've said, hi, all. Oh, and I know you were busy, but a Rask holiday get-together would be awesome. Goon, where are you located? Where are you located, Goon? Tell me that because, um, yeah, uh, let let us know. Um, Jay Campos, you said, they, I've always thought they sound very Australian, so mission accomplished. Thank you. Yeah, he's done a fantastic job. Um, he's done a fantastic job in putting this all together. Uh, so uh, I just want to reassure everyone, we're not going anywhere. We're actually going to grow as a result of this. Um, and we still do the podcast. One of the options that we might pursue in 2024, for example, instead of doing the, um, the Rask Live myself every week, we might do the Rask Live with Drew, who has been on the show before, and then make that into an episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, because we do that anyway. So I basically um, do that as well. So I figured, well, maybe we could do them together. So it may not be by forever. It may just be by for now. And so that's just uh, one of the things. Well, Goon, you're in Sydney. Um, well, we are doing four events next year. We're going to do Melbourne, Perth, Bris Vegas, and Sydney. Uh, so Goon, you'll definitely be able to catch up with us in person next year and some of our hosts and what have you. Uh, but I'm also coming through Sydney every now and again. So perhaps you can send me an email and we can grab a coffee or a uh, a lunch or something like that. Okay, so um, deals, deals, deals. I've got we've got a wonderful presentation to put together tonight too. By the way, guys, so don't worry, it's not just going to be me rambling about the live show. Um, deals, deals, deals. If you haven't already got your book through Major Street Publishing, I've got a couple of these books behind me. Um, da, 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 da. There's one right there, and there's another one. 
So, da, da, da. I've got, oh, there's another one. Okay. So first time stepping away from the camera while on a live show. But if you haven't already used the coupon code RASKXmas, you can pick up some of these books, 50% um, off. Even this one is a Major Street Publishing Tiles. It's a great business book. Um, they're all available on the Major Street website. Uh, Major Street Publishing, if you get any of their personal finance or business books, you can get them 50% off. Use the coupon code RASKXmas. We don't get anything for that, obviously. And if you want to become a member of our rask core service which is our membership community where i'll still be doing some lives next year um you can join the community and get 50 percent off when you use the coupon code live l-i-v-e just use that during the checkout and bob's your uncle um okay so that's that uh what else have i got for you okay du -du -du. okay so i i now know thanks to your feedback that the by far the most important thing that you want to know about is basically retirement, whether that's early retirement, retirement on time, all those types of things. Um, oh, and just quickly on that, if, uh, well, where was it? Retirement, retirement. Oh, yes, in here. Um, so we now don't, we don't do financial planning at RASP, but if you want to match with a financial planner, you can head to our website and click on financial planning. Um, all of the financial planners that work across our network, I individually vet them. So um, I review not everyone's statement of advice, but I review a batch of statement of advice. I review the FSG. I go through all the motions that I would go through to proof a financial advisor. But obviously, I have a little bit more sway. So I can ask for copies of past, present uh, financial planners, and I can review the type of advice that they give. Uh, obviously, they have to get their client's consent and all that um, before they share anything with me, and it's anonymized. But um, I review the financial planners that want to present and be part of our network so then other people can connect. Um, so if you want to, uh, financial planning, there you go. Okay. So cut to the chase, as Jason just says. Okay. So tonight's uh, episode, the final installment, is going to be about uh, 10 ways to retire wealthy. Now, in this section, I'm going to focus on a few different things, and I'm going to try and bridge a few gaps from whether you're just starting out or whether you're nearing retirement. So there'll be a few slides, full uh, full disclosure. I did do a few slides tonight. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to focus on is attitude. And attitude is not necessarily an investment strategy, but I'm the very fortunate position, and many of us are too, that when you've come across very wealthy people, one thing you may notice is that not many of the people that have done very well and have been very successful have very poor attitudes. And what I mean that to be, I, I mean, I said this is kind of like a pun, a play on words here, but um, I've ne met no one who is very wealthy that has a very poor attitude. And some people think, well, it's easy if you're wealthy to have a good attitude because everything's easy. But that's not necessarily the case. And so for me, I've found that all of the people who are successful, not just financially successful, but successful in relationships or successful in their careers, none of them have a poor attitude. And yet I meet so many people who complain, who whinge about things, who blame, quote unquote, the system or find a reason that, quote unquote, they are doing something wrong or, you know, people who come up to me at events and they say, you know, how are we going to, you know, the system is corrupt and all this sort of stuff. Those are the types of people who have the attitude that's not necessarily going to help them succeed. And so over my years of studying CEOs and founders and investors and these types of people, what I've found is that they all have a particular type of attitude when it comes to making money. Even if they don't have millions of dollars, they still have this type of attitude. Uh, and I don't want to get, I, I kind of, I, I don't read self-help books. I don't really get into that sort of thing because I think the, uh, there's an irony with a self-help book is that it's not really a self-help book uh, because you're using the book for help. It's not self. Uh, so it's like self-managed super funds. Most self-managed super funds are not managed by the self. They're managed by a professional, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of calling them self-managed super funds. Um, so. This idea of an abundance mindset is something that's kind of grown on me recently. And this is a quote from Forbes here that found if you focus on something, you're more likely to achieve it. And it sounds pretty obvious, right? 
as I said at the top of the show. Um, and in psychology, they call this, uh, they say that the brain is very literal. And so if you believe that you're going to retire wealthy, it's actually one of the first steps you can take to actually retiring wealthy. Uh, and I see that with so many people around me. If you have a can-do attitude, you can probably achieve it. Um, so that would be the first thing there. Um, number two is for people who are starting out, um, if you're getting on this journey towards creating wealth, some people will know who this fella is right here. This is Glenn James. He's a uh, very, he was a very successful financial planner, and then he turned into a podcaster and educator. And he's got an incredibly fast-growing business himself, and he's done really, really well. Uh, and he often remarks that a lot of people focus on investing, and they get their investment returns. Like you'll log into you'll log into Self Wealth and. Um, or your brokerage platform, and you'll try and find an investment, and you'll you'll spend half a day deciding, hey, do I want to invest in A two hundred, or do I want to invest in VDHG? Do I want to invest in IVV, or do I want to invest in NDQ? If you've got less than a hundred thousand dollars, it probably doesn't matter as much. Just buy one of them, um, or buy all of them. Just get on with it. It doesn't really matter, uh, and. The reason I say that is because if you have an investment balance in your super fund or in your brokerage account, it's under 100K, what's going to get you to $100,000 faster? Saving more, which is investing in your career so you earn more, so you can save more, or picking which ETF is going to outperform the other ETF by 0.05%. It won't really make a difference which ETF you go with but it will make a difference if you can find a way to earn more, whether it's through a side hustle, whether it's through changing careers, whether it's through doing an educational course that gets you a promotion, whatever the case may be, investing in yourself is the very first step you should take to maximize your ability to retire the way you want or even early. Um, and so, uh, you know, th th there's this old financial planning cliche that, you cannot invest your way out of a savings mistake, but you can save your way out of an investing mistake. And so many people, they'll just jump the gun, get straight into investing, and they just bypass the single most important thing, which is, do I have a good financial hygiene? Is my financial house in order? Um, and that's pretty simple. It can be revealing. I say it's simple. It's not easy. Um, you can, you know, do your own budget. You can jump in a spreadsheet. You can review your bank statement. That's all your financial planning would do for you anyway. So you may as well just have a look at it and check it out. Um, but invest the fastest way to $100,000 is to actually invest in your, yourself and your career and figure out what's holding you back from um, earning more. So a financial planner who I deeply, deeply respect uh, and a fantastic business person and investor in his own right, when I first met him, I was trying to t talk to him about the way he runs his financial planning business to find out if he's actually, in my opinion, you know, worth listening to. And he's, you know, I, I, I should have respect for this person because of the way they conduct themselves. And he said, to be honest, you don't need to pay me to be your financial planner. You don't need to pay me. If you just go through life and you avoid the major, I won't repeat the exact word that he said, but it was something along the lines of an F up. If you just avoid the major F ups that people make, you'll be fine. Uh, and I'll explain some of those in a minute. But the, clearly the most um, prominent mistakes that people make is they get stuck in speculations. So speculations are things like Bitcoin, which in my opinion, is just outright lunacy for people to invest in. I just think it's an absolute farce along with all of the other cryptocurrencies. I just think it's a joke. And I just think that um, people that want to invest in that, that's fine. That's by all means, but contain it to a very small part of your portfolio because at the end of the day, uh, while the price may go up, it does not necessarily make it a good investment. It's a pure speculation. Um, and so if you take too many speculations over your life, I think you're tilting the odds towards failure, not success. Some of them may work, but it does not necessarily make it a good decision. Um, much like Annie Duke, the famous poker player, uh, and I guess, I don't know what you'd call her, but um, Annie Duke says that this is something called resulting. If they invest time and energy into making a decision and they make that decision and the thing works, they think because it works, it was a good decision. 
does not necessarily make something a good decision just because the share price or just because the Bitcoin price goes up. It does not mean that it was a good decision. And so the decision making process is like based on proper data, proper evidence that would support a conclusion. Another thing that people get really wrong, in my opinion, uh, is they over leverage with bad debt. Bad debt is the type of debt where you use it to invest in something that does not appreciate in value. Um, credit cards and these types of things can be wonderful assets for cash flow management and for points hacking and all that sort of stuff, but they can be very dangerous in the wrong hands, which is why a lot of people avoid them. Um, many of you who submitted your, um, let me just have a look. Many of you that submitted your biggest regrets, you said to me, um, your biggest regret, is it this one? No, 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 no. Okay, I cannot find it. Um, I'll find it later on and I'll find the answer. But many of you who submitted your biggest financial mistakes, there was a common element in some of them. And one of the things was relationships. Many of you said that relationships were the thing that caused you the biggest financial pressure. Um, being in the wrong relationships, being around the wrong people for too long. So it's not necessarily like divorce. It could be being surrounded by people that, you know, bring the average down, so to speak. And so that's a, a mistake that a lot of people make. Uh, and it's not an easy one. And I'm not here to tell you what is right or wrong, but that's just what everyone in the community tended to show me. Um, so another thing where people tend to go wrong is they tend to forget that their superannuation is invested in the stock market for them. And I shared this chart on social media a few weeks ago, and a lot of people saw it and they thought, well, I need to go and review this. But I was chatting to a financial planner and he said, I speak to a lot of people that have read the Barefoot Investor book, which is the absolutely standout book in Australian finance. It's the one, most wonderful book on finance in Australia ever written, I reckon. Uh, and I do not have it on the shelf behind me. It must be in the behind the cupboards. Um, but a lot of people ended up going with the Host Plus superannuation fund, which is a big superannuation fund. And what people think when you ask them what super fund are you with, they go Host Plus, Australian Super, CBUS, uh, HESTA, uh, the Retirement Trust, these types of things. But that is only one aspect of what it means to pick a superannuation fund. The single most important thing when you pick your superannuation fund is you look at all of the fees. So I've explained this for a lot of people, but uh, this is what people do when they have a super fund, especially as even as they lead up to retirement, they don't realize this. I showed someone this the other day and I was just blown away and he was trying to retire in the next two years is when you have a super fund. So say this is host plus, Inside the super fund, you have many different options. Now, with Host Plus, you might pay, I don't know what the exact figure is, but to the actual super fund, you might pay $100 a year. But depending on which option you go with, that's where you might pay fees. And in this instance, what we can see here, if I zoom us in a little bit, what you can see here is the total investment fees, and this is 0.98%. That's for the balanced option inside Host Plus. When Barefoot Investor wrote his book, he was not talking about the balanced option. He was talking about the indexed option, which is this one right down the bottom here, if you can see that, 0.04%. That's the one that he was talking about, not this one. And so people make this mistake. They just select a super fund and think, Oh, well, I'm done now. And I'm going to show you why this is important for retirement in just a sec. But let's just think about these numbers. So that's 0.98%. That's 0.04. That's about 20 times in difference, 20 times over in fees. That is a huge difference, humongous difference. So over time, that actually adds up. And let me show you what it, what it looks like. So the Productivity Commission came out a few years ago, and they said that, and they did this little useful chart of a 21-year-old, so a bit younger, but they did a 21-year-old earning a $50,000 salary. And they showed that if you had two, two, they had two pathways that they could go exactly the same, they want to retire at 67. If they just simply chose the super fund that has 0.5% higher fees, all else being equal, that person retires with 12% less. 
But that 12% less for this person is actually two years of work. And that's the difference when you choose a superannuation fund that doesn't perform or its fees are not up to scratch. And so a lot of people can solve this problem by checking and reviewing the super fund. Even if you don't see a financial advisor, you can review it. You just need to be very careful, obviously. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. Read the product disclosure statement. And most importantly, make sure you're covered for insurance before you make any changes with any superannuation fund ever. Um, but this is just from the Productivity Commission. You can go and Google Productivity Commission Super. Now, some the reason why I share this with you is because there's another tip that I have in a moment for superannuation if you're closer to retirement. Uh, that will be with me, you in a sec. Last week on the show, we had Pete Wargent, uh, one of Australia's leading property economists and property thinkers. Um, and Pete introduces to the idea of using property as a way to create wealth. And he had, you might remember, he had three charts. One of those were very fancy and it showed you different houses and leverage and debt. And if you added properties and blah, 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 blah. The thing, the only thing, well, not the only thing, but one of the things that I find appealing about property after so many years of not in, being, wanting to be involved with it is this, is that it's one of the only things, residential property, one of the only things where you can use a, a huge, humongous loan to buy the asset. Now, I know what you're thinking. You just said something about don't use debt and all this sort of stuff. So the debt element, this is fair. You know, it is the risk. This is where you get the risk from. This thing right here, this is the debt. But you can get exposure to an asset, the full value. So that's not the debt. That's Sorry, that's not the debt. This is the full value of the home. This is the debt right here. You can get exposure to the full value of an asset for less equity. And it's the only asset class and only asset that you can do this with. If you were to invest in shares using debt, for example, you'd have to use a margin loan unless you secure that loan against something else. And I'll explain that now. Uh, I know this is very simple for me to say, um, but buying a property, if you can, even if it's not something that uh, you live in, um, buying a property is one of the keys that I've, it, it's obvious. I don't, it's not an original thought for me to say that tonight. Um, so one of the charts that uh, Pete showed showed how you can use leverage sensibly. But if we take the same idea again, so property value, and then we've got uh, the loan, and then we've got the equity. So the difference between the loan and the value of the property. Over time, if you purchase the right property, um, you believe that uh, the value of that property increases and your equity increases because you may be paying down the loan, for example, or maybe it's interest only and the loan value increases. You can actually use that equity. And a lot of people in Australia have historically used extra equity that they've built up. They'll take half that equity and then they'll use that equity to apply against another investment property, which then they use more debt for. And that's fine. But what we're seeing Victoria now, in particular Victoria, by the way, I'm going to pick on the Victorians. Um, is that we're seeing more and more taxes being put on to property investors. So more and more, like in Victoria in particular, there's very high stamp duty uh, and you also have property taxes which are going up. Now, this is not a Victorian thing necessarily. It's just there at the pointy end. Um, all around the country, governments are looking at ways to ease the housing crisis. And one way is to make it more difficult for property investors. Um, so what a lot of property investors are going to do over the next 10 years especially those that are approaching retirement, is they're going to look to do something with this equity that they've got in their investment properties. And one of the things that they can do is they can use the equity that they have to invest in an ETF portfolio. So uh, it's now easier than ever to build uh, a portfolio uh, and they can use the equity against the existing home that they have. Say if this was their, um, their home, they can use its principal place of residence, that's uh, where they live. Um, they can use the equity and redraw some of that equity to invest in a share portfolio. Um, now you can speak to your accountant, but because the money that you would be using to invest in the portfolio um, is used for investment purposes, it may actually be tax deductible, the interest that you pay just on this component, just on this component. And so people have been doing this for years. They call it kind of like a line of credit uh, where you redraw some of the 
the equity out of a home or take it out of your offset account um, and you use that for investment purposes. A good accountant and mortgage broker can help you set this up because if you get it wrong, you don't want that to happen. But one of the things that people then do is they use their share portfolio. They use the share portfolio, uh, which I'll explain in a minute. They use the share portfolio to invest into stocks that pay franking credits. So over here in this first instance, they've got potentially, speak to your accountant, a tax deductible loan um, with the interest that's tax deductible, by the way, not the full loan, just the, the interest. The tax deductible loan that invests into shares that then pay franking credits, which many of you will know a tax effective income is tax effective income. So I need to go down a bit. Tax effective income. So you have this kind of wonderful thing where hopefully the value of your property goes up, which then brings up the equity value in your property, which is then invested into an asset that hopefully then grows and produces a tax effective income stream um, for that portfolio. Now, obviously, only Australian companies pay for income credits, but you get the idea. Um, and this is a very effective strategy. And I think as more people realize that holding multiple investment properties is going to be less politically friendly, um, they might look to other ways to create wealth by, like, say, investing in an ETF portfolio that pays for income credits. So if you're over 50, I think one of the most sensible things that anyone would recommend and a financial planner would recommend is to use extra money to make extra contributions to super. Um, maybe this is where I'll pause for a moment and catch breath. Uh, AKA debt recycling. Yes, yeah, very simple. Uh, Taipan, thank you. Um, uh, duh, 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 duh. So, um, okay. So, can um, anyone tell me uh, do you put extra money into superannuation? Do you um, do you put any money or have you ever put any extra money into super? While you do that, I'm just going to read the comments. So I'm going to catch some breath. Um, duh, 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 duh. Uh, I love that quote from you, Penny. And when you choose your friends today, you are choosing your habits tomorrow. I love that. I was actually going to share something, which um, I might come back to that, Penny. By the end of the show, I might come back to this. There was actually something that I was going to share with this elephant and this thing right here. I'll come back to that at the end of the show if we want to talk about that. But great quote. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, any brokerage? Uh, uh, so, Jeremy Owen, is this possible with your family home, for example, if you own 100% of it? Uh, yes, Jeremy. So, um, obviously, speak to your accountant, speak to your mortgage broker. But it doesn't matter if the home is your principal place of residence, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, this is a home, principal place of residence where you live. Um, the idea is that a property, a bank is more likely to lend on a property at lower interest rates, which is a good thing, than uh, any other type of asset. So you can get a loan to buy shares, but oftentimes the interest rate on that loan is like 10%, which defeats the purpose of having the loan uh, because most people can't achieve it over 10% return. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, PDP, PDP, you said you salary sacrifice. Yeah, fantastic. So Penny, you said I have maxed out concessional contributions ever since I was in my early 20s. Amazing. Salah, you've said yes, maximum allowable limit of 27,500. Um, love this, love this, love this. Uh, Matthew, you add an extra thousand bucks every year. Max out my super, says Matt. Uh, Hayden, you said yes, under 30 and contribute a large sum of money to the super. Great. Um, uh, pocket full of shows said used to salary sacrifice into super until that cap came into place. Reggie says the same thing. Um, Katar says always add more. Jesus. Okay. This is all great. You guys are doing so well. So basically, uh, one of the things that many people do is they take money out of their pocket. Let's just say that's their pocket. Look at that good looking pocket. Or let's just say that that's their wallet. They get their salary into their wallet and they put extra money into their piggy bank. Right. Um, the key thing to keep in mind is your employer also puts money into your super fund. And so say if you earned 100 grand, um, you would roughly get 10K uh, going into your super fund. Um, so the allowable limit in Australia is 27,500. There are some um, 
There are some rules that you can be aware of if you speak to your financial advisor, 27,500, which means that if anyone is not maximizing their super contributions up to 27,500, you can always put extra in yourself. And then the key point is this, for most people, not for everyone, but for most people, it may be possible to claim a tax deduction for putting money into your own super fund. So you can claim a tax deduction, but there are some rules and there are some other things that you should consult with your financial planner with, um, or you just read the super funds website. This one's just here from Australian super. You can see J Jane contributes an extra four grand to a super in April. Jane sends her tax deduction claim form to Australian super. And then that just looks like this. Um, that just looks like this form right here, like this thing. Um, she fills in this form, sends it off to her super fund. Jane submits her tax return. And it says here, Jane must submit her claim for her, a tax deduction before the earlier of lodging her tax return. So she needs to do the, the claim form before that, obviously. Uh, and June 30th of the following financial year. So there are limits to all of this. That's only one form of contribution. And this is just the standard rate. Um, you may be eligible for more or less contributions to your super depending on your balance. And there's another thing called um, there's another thing called a non-concessional contribution, which uh, the geese has just pointed out. Non-concessional payments of $110,000 each will also help. Three years payment can be brought forward. Wonderful. Thank you, my friend. Yes. So um, this is only one form of getting money into super. And the people at home are probably asking themselves if they don't know this already. Why would you put extra money into super? It's because for most superannuation funds, the returns that are achieved inside the super fund are only taxed at 15% versus um, outside of super, which is at your normal tax rate, which could be as high as 47%. So there are rules, and I can see a few of you have already cotton under this, Mike, um, Payam. There is a transfer balance cap. So when you reach retirement and you decide to transfer into pension phase, there is a limit on that amount. Uh, and the key thing is that it's like, a, it's a limit, but there's, it's a tax threshold basically. So that's, that's all it is. It's a tax threshold. So if you've got less than a million dollars in super, don't worry, happy days, keep contributing extra. Um, that's not personal advice is general, of course, everything is general tonight, but that gives you a sense of what uh, the limits are. Like there's the limits quite a bit higher uh, than that. So, uh, Yes. So, Paul, another great point. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. This is what I love to see. So there is also something I read about. If you sell your principal place of residence, i.e. your home, you can contribute extras to super without penalties. Yes, Paul. Um, it's the yeah the downsizer method. But there's also now limits to contribute more upfront, Paul, as well. You don't necessarily need to have sold a home. Uh, another thing to keep in mind uh, is that if you're a small business owner, and I'll get to that in just a second, you may be able to contribute um, more of the money that you have into super as well. If you sell that business, for example. Now, I won't bore you with the specifics because it is very boring, that part of the legislation. You won't find it as easy to, to kind of translate into English. But um, there is a there are some concessions for small business owners to transfer money into their super fund when they decide to retire. And I'm saying it is extremely compelling, guys. If you own a small business, go and speak to a financial planner long before you plan to retire. It could be the difference of hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars, right? So go and speak to a financial planner with all of this stuff when it comes to super. Uh, and if you are contributing extra, even if you just be pay an extra couple of bucks a month, like I just put an extra amount of money to cover my extra insurance, I still claim a tax deduction at the end of the financial year. So that's that. Okay, so uh, many of you will be familiar with Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant. You can earn a salary. You can become a contractor and probably earn a little bit more. Uh, you can start a company and run your own business, or you can invest in other people's businesses. So pay as you go, which is just if you're on a salary, you know your taxes withheld by your employer. Australian business number, this would be what you need if you're going to be a sole trader or do some contracting work or a side hustle like Airbnb, or not Airbnb, like uh, Uber or something like that. An ACN is an Australian company number. This is when you take your business seriously and you're starting to turn over 100 grand a year or more. You probably want to be in a company structure. And the ASX is the Australian stock market. 
Um, that's obviously when you invest in someone else's business. So most people in Australia spend too long in this part of the cash flow quadrant. They're just earning their salary, contributing a little bit extra to super, which is great. Maybe trying to pay an extra little bit on their mortgage. If you want to retire on time or retire really comfortably, you've got to find a way to move out of this part of the quadrant. You've got to move into starting your own business, which is extreme. Uh, a lot of people don't want to do that, and I do not blame you. Or just investing in someone else's business. And that could be a private business. It could be on the ASX. It could be on the US stock market. It could be an ETF. But you've got to invest. That's how. That's the only way you can make your money work for you is if you invest. Now, some people would say, well, you can pay off your property. Yes, you can. That's a good idea too. Put it in an offset account. For what it's worth, guys, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of paying off my home, my mortgage. I just don't, it doesn't make financial sense to me, so I don't do it. Um, I instead prefer to put the money in an offset account, and then that gives me more flexibility in the future. I hope that makes sense. Um, so this is the cash flow quadrant. Uh, it's one of the ways that uh, anyone can kind of think about growing wealthy and show your kids this chart. If you're trying to teach your kids about money, you can say, well, you can work for the rest of your life uh, on a salary, which is fine. You can do really well in your career, which is great, but you want to make your money work for you. So there are other ways you can go about it. Okay. So before I get to this, I'm going to catch my breath. Um, duh, 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 duh. Deepak, you've said that... Um, my super fund only mentions that se the sectors that, that is invested in on their website. Can I find out what the underlying investments are? Um, there is so many of the uh, many of the super funds make it very, 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 very hard to find out uh, where your money is actually invested. Uh, da, da, da. There is a part on the web, some websites, and I thought Australian Super had it, uh, and they could still have it. Now, Deepak, I just don't know where it is off the top of my head. Um, you will get sector breakdowns like this, but one of the things I didn't have time to mention before is that you can go into your Super Fund and you can select. This is not just for you, Deepak, it's for everyone, general advice only, of course. Um, there are pre mixed options, which is just like when you get a a glass of Coke from the pub. Uh, they kind of mix it. Um, or you can do your own mix, which is where you pour your own syrup and you put things together. A DIY, uh, sorry, a, um, a member direct is what I'm looking for. In Australian Super, and I'm just using them as the case study. This is not an endorsement for them. But um, in this option, people can invest in some of the things that they want to invest in themselves. So they log into their account and they just go and choose their own ETFs. It's that simple. So if you don't want to just go into the balance option, if you're an investor and you want to kind of just manage your own money, you don't need to start a self-managed super fund. You can just log into your own super fund and direct the money. Now, not everyone offers this and it is risky because you're um, you're investing your own super fund. So um, that's just something that's it's a feature. That's what I'll say. Um, um, so Vince, can you claim a tax deduction on superannuation contributions, even if your contribution was made pre-tax, i.e. you ask your employer to take it out before tax? Uh, so that's what we call salary sacrifice, Vince. Uh, and there'll be heaps of information available on the uh, ATO website for you, good friend, or just speak to your accountant. Um, it's a, the thing is, it's effectively the same thing. So I don't use a salary sacrifice arrangement just because I like the flexibility of uh, being able to do it myself. ABN equals side hustle. Yes, absolutely, Taipan. Thank you, Matt. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going on. Let's move on. Okay. I was going to ask you a question. So many of you will know the core and satellite approach by now. We've been talking about it for three years. So this is a test of everyone that's been watching for the past two or three years. What are some examples? If someone else... Um, if someone else is here watching tonight and it's their first time watching one of these shows, unfortunately, maybe their last time, at least for 2023. Um, if they're watching this show, right, and they're wondering, what is this chart, Owen, that you've put on the screen? Let's help them out. Guys, what are the types of things that go in the core of a portfolio? If you're building a portfolio, what are the types of things that go in there? Think about it. Let me know. Tell me what you mean. 
uh, when you say we've got a core portfolio. Chuck that in there. I was going to have a gin and tonic tonight to celebrate uh, Christmas, but I ended up not doing that because I'm sensible, just as full, for full disclosure. It's just um, it's just the tonic, no gin. Uh, VAS ETF says PDB. VAS. Mm, what do we win, says Jeremy? <laughs> uh, well, you can, uh, Jeremy, if you come to a RASC event next year, you can have a hat just like this one. Uh, it's, a, it's a good hat. keeps the sun out of your eyes. Uh, it comes in one or two colors, and that's basically all I've got. Or I'll give you a book. How about that? Um, so IVV is another one. That's US shares. So that would be boom, like right here. Um, uh, yep, STW is the same. Good one, Vince. So STW is basically the same as VAS. Um, uh, IOZ, yep, that's exactly the same as well, basically, as both of those. IOZ, that's a Z. Gold could be in there. That's correct, Kadar. Now, gold is a quite a contentious one because gold could go like in the defensive part, but it could also go in a satellite for some people. Uh, d -d 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 Paul says Sol. Yeah, so that's a direct share. So if you're investing in an Aussie share, that would be like in here. So Sol Pattinson is a company. It's not an ETF, but you get the picture. Uh, VGS says Umbrella Lemming. Yes, yeah, so Gary, good to see you. So uh, VGS would be like in here. Um, global shares, uh, VHY, which is a dividend ETF, that could be in there as well. So that would be like here. Um, A200 is the same as VAS and all those. Very low cost. Um, good one. IAF says Benny. Thanks, mate. Good to see you. So IAF would go in there. Um, so we've got uh, FM, Femex says Harry. Yes, it would be the type of thing that goes in here. Femex. Um, or any emerging market ETF, so it might be like IEM. Thanks, Harry. Uh, we've got VAP, Vanguard Australian Properties ETF. Yeah, that could go in here. That's just, geez, that's a terrible one. VAP. So this is just an example portfolio, right, guys? This is not like me recommending all of these things in here, just so we are all on the same page. IOO is international shares. Yep, that's right, Harry. So that's like the top 100 global shares or something like that at the top of my head. Um, Vagese, you said QLTY uh, quality. Yes, that's also in here. QL, QLTY is from beta shares. Uh, that's like a quality one. Listed properties, BWP. That's the Bunnings Warehouse Trust, says Vince. Um, yeah, so we've basically just helped everyone put together a portfolio. I'll put one in here, which is... Uh, V, B, and D, which is a global bond ETF. There are heaps of other global bond ETFs and Aussie bond ETFs that you could put in. The cash could be uh, AAA. These are just examples, guys, right, of course. So a core portfolio. The middle of it should be boring. You could use ETFs. I use ETFs for almost all of it. Uh, you could use individual shares. Uh, you could use uh, real estate investment trusts, although you don't want too many of them. Uh, just, a, just a few is fine. Uh, you could use some commodities, maybe like gold. Um, you want some bonds in there. You want some global shares, some Aussie. You want a lot of Aussie shares for the franking credits. Um, and that's it. So that goes in the core of the portfolio. Should be boring, should be low cost, should be extremely well diversified across number of shares, but also across different asset classes. Okay, that's number nine. So you can do that yourself in your own brokerage account, just like Self Wealth. You can log back in um, and then start. Not, not Again, not giving personal advice. I'm not saying to buy all these ETFs. The whole reason that we have a membership at RASC is because we build these portfolios for our community, which they can then follow in their own uh, brokerage accounts. And we monitor it and do all that sort of stuff so that everyone else doesn't have to. Okay, final thing, a final slide. If you want to prepare for a time, we can invest in individual shares as well. So we just mentioned the core of a portfolio. That's what we just covered. Now let's talk about our mighty fine uh, individual companies, which I know so many of us love and you want me to talk about as much as possible. Um, uh, Taipan, you've said, uh, you, you've said, uh, oh, I'm interested. Have you looked at Hack and your thoughts? I think Hack is a great ETF. I think Hack uh, is a cybersecurity ETF. I think Hack uh, and uh, ACDC, I think those are two of the best thematic ETFs along with Qual, Q-U-A-L. Just if anyone invests in these types of different types of ETFs, 
so they're not like standard vanilla index fund ETFs, just be very careful about overlap. Because let's imagine, for example, you've got Hack here, you've got ACDC in here, and then you've got Qual in there, right? So if we just took a quick look at, say, ACDC, it's the global tech, uh, it's like lithium and battery technologies. So if we go down here, we would see that Tesla's 4% of this portfolio, but we also know Tesla's one of the biggest companies in the world. So that's going to be part of IVV, NDQ. It's going to be part of, probably going to be part of a Qual ETF. So here we go, go there. Mm. Where are the individual companies? Ah, here we go. So uh, inside Qual, oh, Tesla doesn't actually make the list. That's surprising. I thought it might. You get my point. If you have all of these different thematic ETFs, you just got to know your overall exposure. Because if all of these ETFs were, for example, in one portfolio, then you're international share sliver, which is normally this bit here, might actually be a lot bigger or something like that. So just all about um, quantity. Uh, so um, knowing the kind of exposure and overlap. Okay, so quality over quantity. One thing that I used to do early in my investing days is I used to invest money in stocks or things that I thought were undervalued. The only problem with investing, well, not the only problem, but one of the problems with investing with in undervalued stocks is you end up with really poor quality companies. And the other thing is, if you invest in something just because it looks cheap, you're always looking for a reason to sell it. You're always waiting for it to be not cheap, and then you'd sell it. Contrast that with a company which you can buy and hold for decades. Um, now, you might be thinking, well, that sounds pretty crazy. We know how hard it is to pick individual stocks. Absolutely. You don't have to do this. It's not for everyone. But this is more for the uh, share investors out there like me. What the, the, the data shows, and I know I'm um, kind of... What is it beating a dead horse? Um, we, we, I know we've, I've showed you guys this chart before, but I just want to reinforce it. Is that if you invest in individual shares or individual companies, what the data suggests is that the fortunes favor the companies that grow, not the companies that have low price to earnings ratios or low valuations. That's this bit right here. And as you can see, that works if you're only investing for a year. But over a few years, eventually, it's pointless to look for cheap stocks. What you want to do is you want to try and find companies that are capable of growing their sales and profit for a long period of time. Now, you might be wondering why I put a vacuum in here. That's a Dyson vacuum, super expensive. Um, if you like your Dyson as much as I do, let me know in the chat. I've got my Dyson just over there. I bought it on catch.com and it was pretty cheap because um, I'm too much of a tight ass to, uh, I'm going to say ass, I know. Uh, I'm too much of a tight ass to pay the full freight on a Dyson. But let me tell you, five years later, she's still going strong as ever. And I'm happy that I made the transition and forked out for early days. Penny, love my Dyson. Yeah, uh, the Dysons, let's be honest. Perfect vacuum, says Rob. Let's be honest. It's it's lighter than anything else. It's more powerful. It's simple. It's quick. It charges real fast. It's amazing. All right. Uh, so Paul, Paul says, Mrs. Loves hers. <laughs> Paul, you're supposed to say we love ours. Um, uh, so, uh, so finding companies that can, uh, finding companies that can keep growing for a long period of time. So the types of things that we want, uh, aligned managers or aligned management team. We want an industry which is growing so that a company underlying it can grow even faster. Uh, we want a company that has a competitive advantage. So that's like that ring of water around a big castle. Look at that castle. There we go. Um, we want all of those things when we look at individual companies. So a great example of this is like Charlie Munger buying Costco. We spoke about Costco a few weeks ago on the show. Uh, Costco uh, is a wonderful business that I'll give you an example. Costco only stocks 4,000 products. But when you walk into it, it feels like you're walking into a footy stadium uh, because it's a gigantic warehouse, but it only stocks 4,000 units. Contrast that with a normal supermarket that stocks about 100,000. So Costco's competitive advantage is that it actually makes people pay more because the, the things are bigger, they're bulky items, but also because it, does, it doesn't need a distribution center. It just pushes all the products straight to the store and it moves through the product. So 
even though when you go into a Costco and you see stuff on the shelves, so let's say you go in there and you you see some finished dishwashing tablets. Um, I had to buy some of those the other day at Coles and it was extortionate how expensive that was. Um, but say you buy some finished Powerball tablets, whatever the heck they're called. If you go into Costco, the difference between Costco is that if finish or whoever makes those Powerball tablets for your dishwasher, when they're on the shelf in the Costco, Costco still hasn't paid the supplier because there might be payment terms um, of, say, you know, 30 days. But by the time the 30 days comes due, Costco has already sold that product because the customers like us, like me and Paul here, we walk in and we get a whole box of finished dishwashing tablets. Um, and so Costco has this wonderful business where it effectively doesn't have to pay for the product it's selling. It just clips the ticket on the way through and it makes money from the memberships, gets people a hot dog, uh, which it doesn't make much money on or loses money. But you get the idea. You're looking for wonderful companies like that run by wonderful people with great cultures. And this is the thing. Costco, you wouldn't think, is a growth company. But as you can see from this chart here, 10 years is when the growth kicks in. So a lot of people, when they're investing in individual companies or stocks, they're looking for growth in the next one to two years. Oh, how fast is it going to grow sales this year? It's got a new product coming out next year. That's not the meaningful part of this chart. The meaningful part of this chart is the back half. It's the growth that can be sustained in years five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And that doesn't have to be 20% growth a year. It doesn't have to be 15% growth a year. It can be high single digits like CSL or BHP. You just need to find the companies that grow. That's all it is. Um, that is literally it. Um, Mr. Morkra, yeah, they sell on fixed margins. So the, the, I think it, Mr. Morkra, can you tell me, I'm pretty sure from the top of my head, the number one um one of the rules that they have at Costco for pricing is that there's the the rule of 13. So everything's marked up. Is it marked up by 13% or something like this? They've got some sort of formula for calculating the price. Um, uh, Ragman, you've said, with multiple Huskies in my household, we have found the Millays last longer. The Millays are great vacuums as well. Um, yeah, so uh, PayM, I've read somewhere capital gains taxed at 10% in super versus 15% for income earnings. That's correct. So... Um, you, uh, thanks, Mr. Walker. Thank you. So um, that's correct, Pam. So you have the capital gains tax discount inside super as well. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go back to the beginning. Attitude counts. A lot of people, you know, it's easy for us to let life hurt us and knock us down. But a lot of people that I've found that have been successful with financial and in their other ways in their life, like in relationships, they have a positive attitude. Surround you're the, you're the average of the five people closest to, uh, to Penny's point earlier on. Um, many people will know over the summer this year, we are for the RASC podcasts. Where is it? For the RASC podcast, and in particular, this one right here, we are doing something called the countdown on, on over summer. So from January 1st, until the end of January, we're counting down the most impactful episodes of all time. I've been running that since 2017, um, and we're going to count down episodes um, to the episodes that had the most profound impact on our community. And one of the episodes in that list of 15, I can tell you, it's like Triple J's Hottest 100, for anyone that knows that. Um, one, in one of those episodes, um, we spoke with a guy called Nick Crocker. And Nick Crocker has written this blog post, and I'll get it up now. So this uh, thing right here. So get out of the way, all these pop-ups. So the elephants, a system for better living. So in this, Nick talks about something. Nick's based in Melbourne, by the way. So he's one of my uh, one of my brothers from Melbourne. Um, he talks about this idea of the elephants group. So what is it? The elephants group is a group of people that you can trust to talk to and to share your vulnerabilities with every every quarter. So what I mean by that is he believes that he had this group of friends that he would meet up with every three months. They would go somewhere, they would hire out an Airbnb, and they would just talk with their friends, these really close friends, about things like, bank balance, financial goals, insecurities, doubts, 
any of that sort of stuff. And it gives you a, a framework for doing that. And basically the idea is that you can be vulnerable with someone and you can surround yourself with people who you can trust to help make you a better person. So that's called an elephant's group. I'd encourage you to go check that out. Over here, what I meant to say before, Penny, to your point, is many of you will know that on a company, you have a board of directors like BHP, CSL, Apple. These companies have a board of directors. And what happens in this situation is the CEO, who's this person up here, reports to the boards of the board of directors and the board of directors either approve or disapprove, or disapprove the CEO's strategy, um, budgets and that sort of stuff. That's how board of directors works. So the CEO is accountable to the board of directors. Shane Parrish, who is a fantastic uh, blogger, podcaster, former spy, and I guess growth mentor, um, he has this idea that you can have your own board of directors. So even if you don't grow up and you don't surround yourself with people who are wonderfully positive people, who have an abundance mindset, who are interested in investing, you can still model your life based on the fact that you may have an imaginary board of directors. So what I mean by this is, let's say, for example, you want to um, do better in your job. But uh, in your job, there's no manager, there's no one around you that you think, oh, well, they're probably a good role model. So what you can do is you can imagine in your mind, you can imagine the best role model you could possibly have. They're going to be on your board of directors, your imaginary board of directors. So the next time you do something in your career, you say to yourself, would X, Y, Z person, whatever they per let's say their name is Sally, would Sally say that this is a good idea? Would Sally approve? And so you don't need to surround yourself with great people to make better decisions in your life. You can just imagine if Warren Buffett was in your investment portfolio right now, what would he say about your portfolio? If you opened up your self-wealth account, let's do that right now. Let's go because we started creating some fictitious portfolios last year. Many of you will remember this. Where did it go? There it is. We started creating some fake portfolios a little while ago. Um, so if we were to go, where is, where is my portfolio here? Oh, where it says portfolio. Oh, so if I was going to, if Warren Buffett was sitting over my shoulder here and we logged into our portfolio, what would he think of my portfolio? Would he approve? Um, well, I can say that he probably would look at some of these things and say, well, I've got a lot of ETFs. Uh, what else have we got in here? Um, would he approve of ARB, the bull bar company? So ARB, this is the bull bar company. For those of you that don't know it, they make the bull bars for these things. Otherwise known as things are otherwise known as forward drives. Would he approve of that being in the portfolio? You know what? Warren Buffett probably would because it's got a good brand. It's run by a family. It's got good profit margins. It's got a long growth runway. He probably would. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's what I would say. So uh, you can use a personal board of directors in your life to model not just your shares and your investing, but maybe they model, you model other things in your life. Would your board of directors approve? Invest in your career. For, this is particularly for people that may be younger or maybe starting again after a divorce or a sickness or after your children have been to school and you may need to start your savings regime again and you're investing. Invest in yourself. Invest in your partner so they can earn more. Invest in your career. Um, that is what that message is all about. Avoid the nasties in life. Like I still remember that financial planner when he told me this, I was like, yeah, all those things. He also said, avoid investment properties, which I kind of don't necessarily agree with, but, um, like, I don't think they're terrible. Um, but avoid the nasties, um, check your super fund fees matter, invest in a property. If you can, I noticed someone said the first home super saver scheme, use leverage, but use it wisely. Think about adding extra to super if you're approaching superannuation phase. Start to think more entrepreneurially. Go and push yourself into other things. Invest. Can you, you know, do a side hustle? If you're saving for your first home, anyone that's saving for their first home or a property there, can you use a side hustle as to, as to Pan said before? You'll need an ABN to do that. 
a core and a satellite portfolio. I'm not here to tell you go and invest in ETFs and only invest in ETFs. Go and invest in ASX shares. Go and invest in an active fund manager or an ET index fund. I'm not telling you any of that stuff. What I am telling you is you can have it all if you want to have it all, but just build your core portfolio sensibly. You don't need to do something stupendously outrageous to make money with a core portfolio. The core is where you make most of your money, but boring works, low cost works, diversified works. Then you can have your satellite. So what goes in your satellite? Well, maybe that's where you put your Bitcoin and all that sort of stuff. The, the more speculative stuff, if you want to do it, contain it in there. For me, in my satellite, I put high quality companies. And the reason I do that is because the data suggests that high quality wins because those businesses tend to go on and on and on. And they tend to still be here in 10 years and compounding. So that's that. Okay. Um, I can see a few of you. Um, so, Mark, you've said this board of directors idea is really quite powerful. It's wonderful, isn't it? That comes from Shane Parrish. Mike, that's, uh, that's this book right here, Mike. Uh, Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish. That was the book that he wrote. That's what I, when I interviewed him recently, that's, he wrote, Talks about that in there. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> I can see Goon's given uh, some, talking about the battery of the new Dysons. Um, Jeremy, good question. Okay. So, um, oh, you said, Owen, I know your anxiety with finance drove you to create Rask. Through the eyes of a 35 year old, what would you, what would you do? What would you say is the greatest meaning of your life? The greatest meaning of your life has been to date. I think that's what you're saying, Jeremy. Sorry, mate, if I interpreted that wrong. I don't know. Jeremy, I was saying to someone today, um, someone who is a CEO of a company, I was fortunate to have lunch with him today. I said, uh, for me, I just wanted to have meaning in my life. And that's all I wanted. And it didn't matter how long I lived for. It just be mattered. It just mattered if I had meaning. So if my life had meaning, that was enough for me. And that's what led me to start the company. Um, the, the reason I started Rask was to uh, have a positive impact on people's lives. And so um, I felt like we've, I feel like we've done a pretty good job with Rask over the last few years to get it to over 200,000 people. Do I think there's more that we can do? Yes, absolutely. So I think we can do more over the next two or three years, particularly as we move into helping people manage their money, because that opens us up to the other people in Australia who do not care about which stocks to buy or which ETFs to hold. Uh, it helps us help more people who just want to be pay their money into their account and they want someone to do it for them. So that's going to be a big thing. Um, and I said today, like if, if in a few years Rask just disappeared, that would be obviously pretty hard for me, but at least I would know that we've, um, we've done the right thing and we helped people while we were here. Um, and that would be enough for me. And then I'd just go back and uh, I'd probably go and resume my old tradie apprenticeship, my old carpentry apprenticeship, or do something like that and take a life like that. Um, so that's what I would probably do, mate. So yes, is the answer. I'd say that the meaning has come through building something that ha helps other people. We just happen to do it in finance. Many people help other people with um, in carpentry or... Uh, they run cafes or they support their family and these types of things. I just happen to do it with finance. So that's all there is to that. Um, so thank you, Umbrella. Let me thank you guys. I uh, really appreciate it. So thank you everyone for uh, everything over the past few years with the, the, the Rask Live show. Don't forget, um, we will still be here for a very long time. Rask is not going anywhere. And neither is Self Wealth. Um, on the Self Wealth YouTube channel, there is stuff there from Jason McIntosh. For any of you that are interested in um, trading and, and and stock trading and these types of things, uh, at Rask we've got some big plans for 2024. Where did I put that? Uh, we've got some big plans for 2024. We'll still be doing our live show inside our community. Uh, it'll just probably be once a fortnight or once a month. Um, we've still got online courses. We've enrolled 25,000 people. Recently, we enrolled our 25,000th person. Um, my mission with Rask is to get to 100,000 people in free courses uh, by 2026. So we're enrolling people. We're probably enrolling 
uh, new students at a ca- at a cadence of about a thousand a month, um, and we're getting there. So we're slowly getting there, um, which is great. And we've got some great collaborators on the platform that are helping us do that. Most of the courses are free, as you can see. So um, go and tell your friends this Christmas if they've got some time and they want to learn about finance. That's how they can do it. The quote that I'll leave you with is from the late Charlie Munger. It's actually his book that I'm choosing to read first this summer, which is Poor Charlie's Almanac. Uh, For those of you that know it, Poor Charlie's Almanac. It's a great book. He says, it's so simple. You spend less than you earn, invest shrewdly, avoid toxic people and toxic activities. Try to keep learning all your life and do a lot of delayed gratification or deferred gratification. If you do all those things, you're almost certain to succeed. There's another fantastic quote from last year's Berkshire Hathaway AGM. Um, and it went something to the effect of, it's from Warren. I'm actually, I'll get it up. Um, let me just bring this up. Um, 2023. Okay, I cannot find it. But basically, um, there's a quote from Warren Buffett in the 2022 AGM for Berkshire Hathaway where he says, I've never met, I've never met someone, I've never met, what, is it, what does he say? I've never met a kind person who died unhappy or died without friends, but I've met plenty of people with money who died uh, unhappily. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a there's something to be said, like not everything we do in our life is finance. Surround yourself with great people and the rest of it will take care of itself. Um, there will be roadshows next year in 2024. Special shout out to Rob for all of the hard work over the past two and a half years, three years, for everything you've done um, with the the live show, mate. We do all appreciate it. We're all here because of you. So thank you so much to everyone else that supported us. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys, for rocking up every week, every Wednesday for the past two or three years. It's been awesome. And I got to meet so many of you in person and we got to communicate this year uh, in a way unlike any others in recent years. So have a very Merry Christmas with yourself and your family. Um, don't be a stranger. We're still publishing 10 podcasts a week and some of those are live. Like every Friday for business owners, we go live on a Friday at lunchtime to talk about business. Uh, oftentimes during the week, our property guys will go live or uh, I'll go live with a financial advisor. So you can check that out on the Rask YouTube channel. Uh, and we may be back next year. This is the thing. We may be back. Um Rask Live may be back in 2024, but um, we're just not 100% sure if it's going to happen straight away. That's all. So have a wonderful Christmas, everyone. Don't forget uh, the Scrub Daddy sponge. For those of you that haven't got it, it's $5. Don't have one in here. The Scrub Daddy sponge on Amazon. You can get a Scrub Daddy sponge. This is my one Christmas present uh, idea. Uh, This is the sponge right here. It's $5, $4 on Amazon if you get it now. Look at that. Probably won't arrive before Christmas, but you can get the sponge. It is a wonderful sponge. It's only like four bucks. It could change your life. Um, That's all I'm saying. So that's my Christmas recommendation. Thank you, everyone. For those of you that are um, (laughs) still no idea why he's peddling these things. The Scrub Daddy sponge, Rob, Rob, if you try the sponge and you don't like it, I'll give you your money back, right? If you try the sponge and you don't like it, Rob, I'll give you your money back. If you do like it, I'll buy an extra two more. How about that? I think it's that good. Um, Rohit, I love the scrub daddy and scrub mama. Uh, See, there you go. Uh, (laughs) Harry, no equity in the sponge. Um, Payam, it's on special at Coles. Go and get the sponge, people. Check it out. It's worth it. it. So I'll see you guys. I hope for the new year you can tune into one of the podcasts. Catch me on... uh, Twitter or wherever. Thank you for a wonderful few years, guys. Remember, as we move into 2024, you'll probably read some negative headlines. You'll probably at times feel scared about long-term investing, but it works. Long-term investing works. It has done for 150 years or more. Going back to the 1700s when the first stock market was born, it works because you're investing in a better future. So remember that anytime you get unsure or just tune into a RAS podcast. All right, guys, bye for now. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, I will see you on the other side. Um, and uh, Merry Christmas to to you and your families. And uh, 
I'll see you on the next episode, maybe in 2024. Who knows? We might be back. Bye for now, guys. See you.